delighted to be with you. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, before we get started, let me go off script a little bit. Um, I had the, an opportunity this afternoon to look at the website um, of the, the uh, Parent Family Alliance, and I need to tell you, I was extraordinarily impressed. Uh, you folks are handling some very, very difficult, challenging issues that are challenging issues that, you know, frankly, 10 years ago, we weren't even aware the issues were there, but, but there was no awareness of some of the challenges that families are facing. So uh, the hat's off. I'm, I'm really, really delighted and honored to be, to be with you and to continue the good work that you're doing. Um, it's important work that you're doing and, and uh, Godspeed with it. Um, I also love the name of your organization. It's an alliance. Alliance is defined as an organization that comes together for mutual benefit. And more and more, we're finding families need the support of other families uh, to get through the difficult times that we're facing. Um, it, uh, for years, about 30 years, I ran residential schools for kids with special needs, boarding schools for kids with severe learning disabilities. And one of the things that I noticed was that um, uh, the parents of the kids became lifelong friends. And again, the, the, the school was it, it the uh, national school. It was on, here on Cape Cod where I'm talking to you from. But there were parents literally from all over the country. Pretty much every state in the, in the union was represented. And yet these parents would come extraordinarily close. They'd, they'd go on vacations together. And, you know, parents from California becoming best friends with a set of parents from Iowa. And this went on for years. And, and I was always delighted by it, but intrigued by it. And one day I took one of the dads aside. He was a wonderful dad and a, a, a terrific dad for a special needs kid. He was exactly what his daughter needed. And I said, Earl, why are the families so close? Why do these parents develop such a tight relationship? He said, because we get it. We understand what the other parents are going through. And he said, it was really, really very touching. He said, you know, I'll be out playing golf with uh, a group of my friends and all of our kids are about the same age graduating from high school you know get it or just uh, just graduated from high school and you know one guy is saying gee my daughter can't decide if she wants to go into law or medicine and the other, the other gentleman is saying yeah and my son can't decide if he wants to go to harvard or yale and back and forth and he said and i'm so excited almost out of my skin because my daughter with a learning disability at 17 years old just got her learner's permit to drive after failing the test four times and he said i'm delighted about that but i can't share that i can't share that with my friends who are trying to decide between harvard and yale so i go home and i call one of the parents from the school and they're just as happy as i am about that news and i think that when when you're dealing with kids exceptional kids kids who face challenges sometimes we that parents need to get together and you need to have an organization to support you and so godspeed for that um but one of the things i was most impressed with as i spoke to christina um as we got got going on this is that not only are there some parents and families in the audience but also some professionals and um that has got to happen i am very very concerned about the state of the relationship in american education between home and school um it literally does take a village. It, it, uh, parents and, t and school need to work together as equal partners. And um, I don't see that happening the way that it should be happening, I don't think. Um, I ran, as I said, for 30 years, I ran residential schools for, for kids. And, and the one on Cape Cod that I that I used to run was a beautifully decorated school, wonderful Cape Cod antiques. The Parent Association raised all this money and the school was just beautifully decorated, every room except for one. It was the room that I decorated, uh, decorated it myself. And um, uh, it, when you entered that room, it was a conference room where we met to talk about kids, where we met as a staff to sit down and talk about individ individual children. Or when we met with parents, when they came to talk about their child, we'd meet in the conference room or meeting with consultants from the outside where they had to talk about kids. We would sit in this conference room and have these meetings. And there were no beautiful window treatments, no beautiful plants in the corner, artwork up on the wall. It was totally barren, table and 12 chairs. There was only one thing that hung on the wall, just one thing that hung on the wall. And the reason it was the only thing on the wall is when people walked in there, I wanted them to realize those are the rules once you walk in this room. Those are the rules. And what the sign said was an old African proverb. I don't know about you, I get tired of hearing about new wisdom. No, come on, there's no new wisdom. The wise stuff has already been said. It's in the Bible, it's in Shakespeare, it's in Dickens. All the wise things have been said. And I found this ancient 
African proverb, hundreds of years old, um, uh, and it was so perfect for this situation. I had a sign made, and it hung up in that conference room every day that I worked there for 30 years, and this is what the sign said. When elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. When elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. Two great big two-ton rogue elephants meet in the jungle, and they're banging heads and banging heads, but they're so strong and powerful and well-protected with that bony structure in the front of their skull that even after banging head for two hours, they walk away unscathed, unhurt, ready to fight another day. But in the meantime, every shrub, every blade of grass, every feature of vegetation in the area is trampled and gone forever, and that's the way it is in the lives of kids. If the adults in a kid's life are fighting, it's ultimately the kid who gets hurt. So for parents and teachers, if you know, home and school are having this, the, these ongoing conflicts and ongoing skirmishes between the educators in the kid's life and his parents, it's ultimately the kid who gets hurt. You're big, you're strong, you can go one-to-one -one with that special ed teacher and call each other names and everything, but who, gets, who ends up getting impacted but the kid? He doesn't get the program he needs. So I was delighted to hear that although it is a family and parent alliance, that we've got professionals that are with us today too. That's terrific. Um, unfortunately, uh, I spent the last year of my life before, before the world went upside down doing a lecture series to my colleagues and I will say again, uh, I'm an educator. I'm married to an educator. My five best friends are educators. And one of our kids is an educator. I am a huge believer in school and, and people who sit and stand in the front of the classroom and people who run schools. But I spent the last year before COVID going around on a speaking tour, talking to my colleagues in education and telling them, you just don't get it. Unfortunately, there are so many of my colleagues out there that just don't understand what it's like to have a child with a learning problem or with a behavioral problem or an emotional problem. They don't understand the journey that the special ed parent is on. The special ed parent is on a journey that no one asked for. In the history of mankind, there has never been a pregnant woman who got on her knees and said, dear God, please give me a special needs kid. Give me one of those. Give me a kid who gets those funny stomach aches every Sunday night because he knows he's gonna get back in the roller coaster again. God, give me a kid for whom the worst part of his day is recess and the lunchroom and the school bus ride, the best part of the day for other kids. Give me one of those. No one asks for this journey and we're supposed to be guides in that journey. And as I go around the country working with the universities, I'm insisting that they put together special ed programs for people who want to be special educators, there have got to be specific courses for how to deal with parents and to understand the journey that they're on. You know, as I said, 90% of teachers get it or they're trying to get it and they're working to get it, but there are always a few. And the bottom line is if your kid has one of those teachers that doesn't get it, it doesn't matter, matter if everyone in school does get it. And you know, you think you've heard almost everything after you do this as long as I've done it. But just before the pandemic, I was speaking in Florida, and this young mother came up to me, has a little boy, seven years old, Tourette syndrome. Now that, that's a journey. That family has a long and difficult journey ahead of them. Uh, and she told me the story, listen to this. The kid had been in kindergarten for five days. It was the Friday at the end of his first week in kin kindergarten. And her phone rang at home about eight o'clock that night. And the woman answered the phone, and the woman on the other end said, hello, Mrs. Jones. This is Mrs. Smith, I'm your son's kindergarten teacher and we need to talk. And the mother said, well, thank you for calling, what can I do for you? And the teacher said, but we had a speaker come through this summer and he told us that whenever you call a parent in the phone, you should always begin by saying something kind and positive about the child. Well, frankly, I can't think of a kind or positive thing to say. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being, beginning a telephone call that way? Can you imagine calling and talking to another member of the human race and saying, I've spent 30 hours with your kid and I can't think of a single nice thing to say? You know what the mother said, by the way? The teacher said, I can't think of a single kind thing to say. And the mother said, call me back when you can and hung up the phone, which is like the perfect answer to that. But it's just a testimony that although many of our teachers get it, there are, there are many that simply don't. They don't understand what the parents are going through. They don't understand that the, the issues that, that parents have. Being a parent is tough. It's tougher than it's ever been before. 
We face, as I said, you look at your website, we fa we're facing issues that, that our parents couldn't have dreamed of as we raise kids, even if you don't have a special needs kid and stuff. Before the pandemic, I was speaking in North Carolina and I was flying back home, flying into Logan Airport in Boston where we live. And you know, you're sitting in the back of the plane, you've paid for 18 inches of space. It's like your little world, you know, the, the person next to you could be having a heart attack, you wouldn't even notice it, just kind of protecting your space. And we got about halfway home, we're flying over Washington, D.C. someplace. And I remember I had a lecture to deliver that evening at Boston College, and I hadn't finished putting it together. So I reached into my briefcase and took out, out some educational journals I had and opened up these journals and took some note cards and started taking some notes from these educational journals. And it was a gentleman sitting right to my left and he kind of leaned over into my space and, and, and said to me, excuse me, he said, are you in education? And I said, yes. He said, do you have any children of your own? And I said, yes, I do, we have three. And with that, it was very strange, it was almost mystical. His eyes kind of glazed over and he looked out the window of the plane and shook his head and said, half aloud and half himself, half to himself, and couldn't even tell he was talking to me. He said, God, I wish I had three kids. I'd give anything to have three kids. I said, don't you have any children, sir? And he said, yes, I have six. You know, the point being, it's difficult. It's difficult to parent today. And when there's a special needs child in the mix, when a special needs child is in the mix, it becomes even more complicated. Can I have the next slide, please? Here we go. I do a workshop for parents of kids with special needs called Life on the Waterbed, the special needs child at home and in the family. And the reason I use that title is because of an analogy that I draw in the, work, in the workshop. A family of five is like five people lying side by side on a waterbed. Whenever one person moves, everyone feels a ripple. And that's the way it is in a family. If one member of the family is having trouble, dad's having trouble at work, mom's having trouble at work, one of the kids is struggling at school, if anybody's moving in that family waterbed, everyone feels it. So I say, you don't have a special needs child. You've got a special needs family because every member of the family is impacted by this. I'm writing a book called Life on the Waterbed, and there's going to be a chapter for aunts and uncles, a chapter for grandparents, a chapter for siblings, because everyone in the family is impacted by the special needs child, positively or negatively. But every member of the family is, 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 uh, is impacted, and that's what many educators, school leaders just don't understand, is a tremendous impact it has on the family. You know, I'll say to a teacher, this little guy makes you crazy. In your math class, 40 minutes, a, 40 minutes a day, five days a week, imagine the havoc he's creating at home. Imagine what's going on at home. And so for those of us who do understand the struggle that you have, and for those of you, of you um, uh, parents, it becomes our job to educate the educators. And I was speaking to a mother one time, and she was really, really angry at the school. The child had diabetes. And she said, you know, I know more about diabetes than the teachers do. Well, of course you do. It's your kid. It's your child. I would expect you to know more about diabetes than the typical fourth grade teacher does. It's your kid. You've had, you've know, you know him better. You've had him longer, and he'll be in your life for the rest of your life. You should become the expert in your child. I think the mistake that parents make, well intentioned, but it is a mistake, I believe, is they try to become an expert in the disability. You know, my child has Asperger's syndrome and I want to become an expert in Asperger's syndrome. No, become an expert in your child. Learn the way he learns. Find out what motivates him. Find out what, what makes him excited. Find out um, the best way to teach him and the strategies and techniques you can use. If you want to, when the kids have grown up, go and get a master's degree in Asperger's and, and be an expert, that's fine. But right now, your job is to be an expert in your own kid, not necessarily an expert in the field. And it becomes part of our job as parents who care about these kids and as school teacher, uh, teachers and leaders who care about these kids. We've got, to, we've got to get to the folks who don't understand. And the two most important things that they can understand if they're going to have a positive impact on, on the lives of these kids. The two most important things they need to understand is, first of all, when you talk about kids with learning disabilities, you gotta change one word when we talk about kids with learning disabilities. I wish we, if I were king, I would change one word when we talk about kids with learning disabilities. And I'll bet it's not the word you're thinking of. I'm not one of those who believe we should change learning disabilities to learning different. I really don't believe that. I don't believe in that movement. I spent 30 years in residential schools with these kids, putting them to bed at night and waking them up in the morning. And I'm telling you, these kids have a disability. 
It is not a difference. And I think, frankly, it minimizes their struggle. It minimizes the struggle they've been in to call it to call it a difference. And I'm somebody who spends a lot of my time testifying before leg legislators trying to get more money for our kids. And we're not getting the money we need when we call it a disability. We start calling it a difference and it's all going to just blow away. I mean, when I talk to kids many times, I'll use the word difference. But the bottom line is it is a disability. That's not the word we need to change. The word we need to change, the fundamental need change we need to make in education for our kids, the word we need to, it's a verb. We need to change the verb is to the verb has. We've got to get the people in schools to understand it's not that the kid is a problem, but rather the kid has a problem. Is to has, that's the big difference. That's what we need to change. You see, this kid takes more time, more energy, and more resources than the other kids in class. So the teacher begins to believe this kid is a problem. No, we have to constantly remind him this kid has a problem and make that paradigm shift. And the second thing we need to understand, I can tell when I go to a school that understands these kids and one that, and a school that doesn't. When I go to a school that doesn't understand, I often hear someone say, oh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. He's doing it for attention. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And you hear the administrator say, oh, the special needs parents always griping. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know what we need to understand in special ed? The squeaky wheel needs the grease. That's why it's squeaking. If you don't put some grease on it, it's going to fall off the bloody wagon. I think the ugliest phrase we use in education today is this one, attention-seeking behavior. He's doing it for attention. Well, then give him some. How often does a kid tell us what he needs? And listen to what we say. He's doing it for attention, so I what? Ignored him. <laughs> the kid told you what he needed, and you responded by giving him the opposite? That would be like me saying to Christina, I'm really thirsty, Christina, and she gives me a handful of pretzels. I said, Christina, I told you what I needed. You gave me the absolute opposite. You can ignore the behavior, but you can't ignore the need. The reality is that the kid is doing it to seek attention, give him some attention. How often does a kid tell us what he needs? So all that being said, I'm delighted with the topic that they chose tonight because uh, I feel very, very strongly um, about the need for better education when it comes to social skills and social behavior. Um, it's always been intriguing to me in schools that if the kid can't read, we teach. If the kid can't write, we teach. If the kid can't spell, we teach. If the kid can't do math, we teach. If the kid misbehaves, we punish. No, we should be teaching. We should be teaching kids the proper way to behave and the proper uh, social, ed so, uh, social rules that they need to follow in our society. And of course, when I say social skills, I'm not talking about manners, I'm not talking about which fork to use. I'm talking about the interactional skills, one human being to another. And I just find that there are many folks who simply don't get that. One of the great blessings of my life, as I've said a couple of times already, is I spent the lion's share of my career in residential schools. And so I began, I, I had a, unlike a, a public school teacher, with all due respect to public school teachers who see the kids six hours a day, I saw them 24 hours a day. And I realized very, very early on that the biggest challenge these kids face is social skill difficulties and interactional skills with other kids and with adults and parents and coaches and everybody else. You see, the reality is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the average child spends 1,080 hours a year in the classroom, 1,080 hours a year. Now that sounds like a lot of time, but that's less than 5% of his waking hours. 95% of the kid's time is spent in um, uh, on the school bus, in the cafeteria, at grandma's on weekends, at soccer practice on Tuesday afternoon. 95% of the kid's time is spent in social environments. And this is one area, and I say this unashamedly, one area where the parents have been so far ahead of the curve. This is one area where parents have been saying for 30 years now, will you please work on their social skills? Will you please help them interact with other kids? And education now, just in the last 10 years, is beginning to hear that message, that it pays off for everybody if in the school environment, we work directly with the kids' social skills. Because you see, because they don't have appropriate social skills or social interacting skills, the big price they pay is they don't have friends. They don't have friends. Everything we're gonna to do today is based on my book, um, uh, It's So Much Work to Be Your Friend. Um, 
let me tell you where the title came from. It's so much work to be your friend. I wanted to write a book on social skills. And I don't know about you and if any of you write, but when I have to write an essay or an article or something, I need to come up with a title first. Once I come up with the title, then that gives me the structure to work with it. So I, I want to write a book on social skills, but I couldn't come up with the title. And as I, I was running, I was the head of a, a residential school in Cape Cod for kids with special needs. And there were two girls at the school, 13 years old, uh, uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy and Jen. And they desperately wanted to be friends. They really wanted to have a friendship, but they just they, their social skills were such they kept crashing into each other and the friendship would break up every other day. They'd be angry at each other and yelling at each other in the schoolyard. And this was an ongoing thing. So one day I'm in my office and one of the teachers brought him in by the scruff of the neck. They were both there screaming at each other in the schoolyard. So I said, okay, sit down. So I said, okay, ladies, what's the latest drama? What happened today? Now the two girls were, one with Jen, who was just a sweet, demure, kind, wonderful, good-hearted spirit kid. Just a wonderful, wonderful kid. That was Jen. Now, Kathy, the other girl, was an equally good kid, but very loud and vociferous and would kind of come in and take over a whole room. It's a very commanding presence. And I said, okay, ladies, what happened? So, of course, Kathy took the floor. Jen said she'd be my friend, but I caught her talking to Sally. And Sally, well, Sally's not nice to me. And if she's going to be my friend, she can't talk to Sally. And she's all over poor Jen. And Jen looked at her and shook her head. And she said, it's so much work to be your friend. And I said, oh, there's the title right there. It's so much work to be your friend. It's not supposed to be work. It's supposed to be fun. A friend is a gift you give to yourself. You can't pick your family, but you can pick your friends. And, and, and the reality is that many of our kids go through their lives never having a friend. Many of them, God help us, don't even know what a friend is. My wife was the admissions director at the school and she was interviewing a little boy, fourth grade, for admission to the school. And he was sitting across the desk from her as she was doing the interview. And the, the child's, the boy's mother was sitting behind the boy. And so uh, Janet said to, to the little boy, um, do you have a lot of friends in fourth grade, Michael? You got a lot of friends? He said, yep, yeah, I've got seven friends. I've got seven friends. And Janet looked back at the mother and the mother shaking her head, no, he doesn't. And she said, name your friends, Michael. Who are your friends? What are your friends' names? And he rattled off the names of seven kids. And she said, why are they your friends? What make them, them your friends? He said, they are the kids who don't pick on me. This poor little baby in the fourth grade thought that a friend was someone who doesn't annoy you. A friend is someone who doesn't throw your hat out the bus window. A friend is someone who doesn't knock your book, the cafeteria tray out of your hand in the lunchroom. She, he, his definition of friend is someone who just leaves me alone. Now that's sad, that's sad. I'll bet every one of you right now could take a piece of paper and a pencil and write down the names of your five best friends in fourth grade. And under hypnosis, you could probably remember their telephone numbers. Imagine going through life without a friend. And that's what happens to our kids. They simply don't have friends. And this is painful for them. It's very, very difficult for them. Um, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine was doing a workshop and he had 15 uh, uh, adolescents with learning disabilities up on the stage. They were a panel and they were sitting up on the stage. And at the end of the presentation, he asked the magic wand question. He said to these 15 kids, if I could give you a magic wand and you could make all of your academic problems go away and you'd be able to read, write, and spell like everybody else, or you could take the magic wand and make all your social skill problems go away and you'd have friends, how would you use the wand? 15 out of 15 said, I would make the, I would make the uh, uh, problems go away. I would make the social problems go away so I'd have friends, 15 out of 15. So, it, it, we're going to talk about the reasons why we should be te teaching social skills, but there's, there's some right there. The reality is that we need to understand why kids do the things they do, why they make the social mistakes they make, and what we can do to fix it. Now, every presentation I put together, I keep this little chart in mind. I think that in order to be good at dealing with kids who struggle as a parent or a teacher, there are three things you need to have. You need to be a little check part of the Venn diagram. You need to have knowledge in the field. You need to know why these kids do what they do. You need to have strategies, a bag of tricks, and you need to have a philosophy about the way you, th you think these kids should be dealt with. Now, you and I both know teachers who have all kinds of knowledge in the field. They've got all kinds of strategies, but they don't have a philosophy. They change from day to day. They don't make it. 
We know parents who have all kinds of a great philosophy of raising kids, all kinds of knowledge, but they don't have any bag of tricks. You need to have all of them. And particularly, we're going to begin with knowledge because if you understand why kids do the things they do, you're less likely to get so upset with them. You're less, it's less likely to bother you the things that they do. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was running the school, we, we had a number of kids with Asperger's syndrome. And I'd be walking across the campus. Asperger's was kind of in its infancy. It was always there. But uh, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine has written a wonderful book um, called Diagnosing Jefferson that offers very, very sound advice that Thomas Jefferson had Asperger's. I'm not one of those big believers in famous people with learning disabilities, but all of the evidence that Thomas Jefferson, there were so many things nobody understood about Jefferson. He used to wear his clothes very tight. He used to wear his daughter's vests that were very tight on him, which is a, something with Asperger's folks do. He, uh, he walked in a very strange gait. He didn't move his arms when he walked. He just, you know, walked with his arms by his side, which is something you see with people with Asperger's. He kept meticulous notes his entire life. Um, every single penny, if his grandson asked for a penny, he would give him a penny and write it down. He wrote, kept meticulous notes and yet died tens of thousand dollars in debt, um, which would be typical for somebody uh, that, that dealing with Asperger's. And so we've, Asperger's has always been there, but it's only been the last couple of decades we've really understood about it. And one of the things that used to bother me, frankly, was I'd be walking across the campus and a kid with Asperger's would come running, running over to me and say, Mr. Lavoie, Tuesday or Thursday? Tuesday or Thursday. And I think, what are you talking about Tuesday? What? You know what? I'm a busy man. What are you talking about? Until I began doing some research, and those of you with kids with Asperger's probably know this, that many kids with Asperger's syndrome have what's called uh, magical thinking. And that is, it's a very odd thing, but they think you know everything they know. They think that you know everything they know. There's a great experiment you could do with Asperger's kids. I've done it dozens of times. You take up in my office. I've got a Band-Aid box. The box of Band-Aids. If I held it out here, everybody would know what it is. That that blue and and uh, uh, red and white Band-Aid box that everybody knows. And I and in the box, it's filled with candy. So I'll show the Band-Aid box to a kid with Asperger's, and I'll say, "What do you think's in this box?" And he says, "Well, Band-Aids. It's Band-Aid box." And I open it. I pour it out. I say, "Look, it's full of candy." I said, let's put the candy back in and bring the box downstairs to the teacher's lounge. And let's ask them of the teachers what they think is in the box. What do you think they'll say? And what does the kid say? Candy. Because he knows there's candy in it. He assumes everyone knows there's candy in it. Well, once I understood that, I realized that the kid would see me across campus, across the field. And he says, gee, I wonder if we're going, going to play or going to go bowling on Tuesday or Thursday. LaVoy would know. By the time he gets over to me, he's, he thinks I know what he's thinking. So he comes up to me and says, Tuesday and Thursday. So that one little thing, that behavior that used to puzzle me, once you realize why they're doing it, suddenly it makes a whole lot more sense and you're going to deal more effectively with it. So increasing your knowledge is extraordinarily important. You've got to have a knowledge of the parent or professional, knowledge of why the kids do the things that they do. We're going to use uh, some terminology, not, not a whole lot of technical stuff, but we're going to use some terminology. And uh, next slide, please. And this is, is it kind of bothers me because we use these, I hear professionals who frankly should know better, using these two terms interchangeably, impairment, disability, and handicap. And yet the three are very, very different. They're extraordinarily different, although we use them interchangeably. Yes, he's got a learning impairment, disability, handicap. And let me show you what the, tell you what the difference is. I'll use myself as an example. I am developing a pretty good case of arthritis in my right hand. Okay, I'm about the age that it has onset, and here it is. My mother had it, my father had it, and my grandparents had it, so now it's my turn. So I've got a pretty good uh, uh, case of arthritis developing in my right hand. The impairment, the impairment, is that there's fluid around the knuckles, which makes the knuckles swell and be less flexible. That's the impairment, is the fluid. The disability is, I can't make a tight fist anymore. I really can't make a very tight fist. That's the disability. The handicap is, I don't play golf anymore because the clubs keep flying out of my hand. I don't go to the batting cage, which I used to like to do because I can't hold onto the bat. And I have a difficult time opening jars, okay? so. The impairment is the fluid, the disability is the fist, the handicap is unable to open jars, unable to, to hit a golf ball. Now, when I'm sitting in my office reading, 
Do I have an impairment? Yeah, there's still the fluid. Do I have a disability? Yeah, I can't make a fist. Do I have a handicap? No, because you don't have to make a fist. To sit down and read a book, you don't have to make a fist. So, so the, the, the impairment is, again, the fluid, the disability is the fist, the handicap is, and, and let me tell you what special ed is all about. As I said, I had a very difficult time opening jars, okay? I can't open jars. So I went to CVS and I bought one of these things, okay? And what you do is you put that on the top and you turn it. Basically what I've done, I've got the impairment, I've got the disability, but by having this thing, the disability is no longer a handicap. I still have a disability and I couldn't open this jar without it, but once I got this, what I've done is I've taken the, I prevented the disability from becoming handicapped, and that's what our job is in schools. That's what our job is in schools, is to prevent disability from becoming handicaps. The kid has a visual impairment, therefore he can't read. The disability is he can't read, so, and so he can't read the book. You put the book on tape, the disability is no longer a handicap. That's the job of special education, is to do those things, to try, try to prevent disabilities from becoming handicaps. The other thing we need to understand before we get too deeply into all this is the idea of development. We need to recognize that, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. If I were king, if I were king, I would pass a law that every parent and every teacher and every basketball coach and baseball coach and hockey coach would have to take and pass a course in human development, in child development. Because I find that many of the mistakes we make with our kids are simply because we don't understand basic child development. And I'll tell you what I mean. Those of you who have adolescents, what do we get angry at our adolescent about? What are some behaviors that really bother us about our adolescent? All they want to do is eat and sleep. All they want to do is eat and sleep. He gets up at noontime and then eats a house, eats everything in, in the refrigerator. All they want to do is eat and sleep. Okay, yeah, that can be annoying. But let's take a look at, look at it from a developmental point of view. Adolescence is the second largest growth spurt in the human body. You can grow, you can gain 30 pounds and grow six inches during adolescence. Okay, it's the second largest growth spurt in the, in human development. The first largest growth spurt in human development is infancy. You can double your weight and double your, your length in a period of eight months, okay? What do infants do to fuel that growth? What do infants have to get in order to fuel that incredible growth? A lot of sleep and a lot of food. And the doctor says, keep them well fed and get them plenty of sleep because he needs, that infant needs to eat and sleep in order to fuel that growth. Now, I've never seen a mom get mad at her infant for eating and sleeping all the time. And yet 15 years later, when the adolescent is eating and sleeping all the time for the same reason, parents get all upset with them. If we understood human development, that wouldn't, it wouldn't be such a thing. It wouldn't be such a thing. Let me give you a quick, synopsis of the three stages of human development it in preschool uh, at a school age okay school age basically the in a nutshell if i were to give you a fortune cookie about about school age kids it's simply this kids go to school for a living that's their job that's their job they do it six hours a day for the school age child kid in elementary school kids go to school for a living but in our culture not only is it their job it's their entire identity think about it you're walking through your neighborhood, you bump into an 11-year-old kid you haven't seen for a while. What's the first thing you say to him? Hi, Billy, what? How's school? Now, you might be with his dad for an hour before you'd ask his dad how things are at work. The reality is that in our culture, we identify kids with what they do for a living. It's their entire identity. So when a kid, pre, when a grade school kid, an elementary school kid is failing or struggling at school, it impacts his entire identity. It impacts his entire worldview. It impacts the way he feels about his mom and dad and brothers and sisters, a dog and cat. It impacts the way he feels about school and impacts the way he feels about himself. So when a kid is struggling in school, it impacts his entire identity. You can't say, well, you're home from school now, don't worry about it. No, because our culture identifies that kid. His entire identity is based on how he does in school. The middle school kid, middle school kids are what we call managed by the moment. They live in the moment. There's no past, there's no future. Whatever's happening at that moment in time is the most important event in the history of humankind. When your eighth grade daughter says, my best friend is angry at me, my life is over, she really means her life is over. She really does. 
She really does. They've got no concept of past or future. They live in the moment. And probably the most important for those of us raising adolescents to understand is this. Let me give you the, the Reader's Digest the fortune cookie definition of adolescence. Adolescence is simply this. Adolescence, and once you understand adolescence from this point of view, it'll make many of the things adolescents do you never understood before. It'll make them easy, make those things easy to understand. Adolescence is no more or less than this. Adolescence is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day a year battle to not be embarrassed. That's it. The adolescent prayer every morning is, dear God, don't let me be embarrassed today. And once you realize that that's what adolescence is all about, so many of the things they do that you never understood before make sense. Every time I do a workshop with parents and teachers for adolescents, I say, give me some words to describe adolescence. Invariably, invariably, people will say, adolescents are mean. They're mean. And they are mean. They are. And so are you. So are you. There's nobody listening to this right now that can't think of terrible things you and your friends did to other teenagers as kids. Adolescents are mean, but it's not because they're bad kids from bad families. It's because of what I call the spotlight. Let me tell you what I mean. Let's say that Christina and I live in the same neighborhood, take the school bus together every day. We know each other, we're buddies, we're friends, okay? So, so we're on the school bus going to school. There's me and Christina and seven or eight other adolescents. We're all kind of huddled in the back of the bus having a conversation. But each of us get in the bus with the same secret fear. Dear God, don't let it me be. Don't let it be me. Don't let me say something stupid. Don't let me have worn the wrong, wrong kind of jeans. Don't let me be the one that trips as he's coming up the stairs of the bus. Dear God, don't let it be me. So each of us are sitting there with that same secret fear. And then suddenly Christina says something stupid. I say, oh, great, this is my chance. Christine, I can't believe you said that. That is so dumb. Why would you say that? That is so stupid. Basically, what I'm saying to Christine is say, Christine, I like you, I really do. But I'll throw you under this bus in a minute if it keeps the spotlight off me. What kids soon learn is if you can put the spotlight on somebody else, it can't be on you. So as soon as Christina says something stupid, I jump on Christina because all, all I'm basically saying is if the, the light's on her, it can't be on me. So I jump on Christina, and then Sally jumps on Christina, and Mary jumps on Christina, and Jason jumps on all the others jump on Christina because they're thinking the same thing. They're thinking the same thing. It's Christina today. It's not me. I'll make it through the rest of the bus ride without being embarrassed. And when we get to school and Christina gets off the bus, what the hell was that all about? It was just your turn, babe. Just your turn. Well, we'll have lunch with it. It's all good, but it was your turn today. And so they appear to be mean, but you want to understand that adolescence, a 24 hour a day battle to not be embarrassed. Then what you realize is the most important truth about adolescence, which is simply this, at any given moment, any adolescent would prefer to be viewed as a bad kid than a dumb kid. At any given moment, any adolescent would prefer to be viewed as bad than dumb. And if you put a kid in a position of choosing between looking bad or looking dumb, he will choose to look bad. So let's keep all of that development stuff in mind as we talk about uh, about social skills. Next slide, please, Christina. Okay, you've been doing next one, please. Again, elementary good for a living. Elementary could go for a living. It never say it's only a dance. Every, that dance, that eighth grade dance, the most important event that's ever occurred in the history of mankind. Next slide, please, Christina. Adolescence, again, is a 24-hour day, and at any given moment, any adolescent will prefer to view, view the bad kid with the dumb kid. But, you know, if you deal with teenagers, you've got to keep that in mind. So you're the basketball coach. You've got all the kids sitting in the bleachers, the end of basketball practice. Practice is over there waiting for the bell to ring to go. All of a sudden, you look at your watch, and you say, well, we got five minutes left. we got five minutes left. Uh, Michael, Kevin, come down from the stands. I want you to demonstrate that passing drill we learned yesterday. Come on down from the stands. And as Kevin comes off the stands, he slaps some other kid in the back of the head. You need to think, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Because he couldn't do the drill. And he's coming off the stands and he's thinking, I don't remember how you do that drill. I don't know if you move to your left or your right. I'm going to look dumb in front of the coach. I'm going to look dumb in front of the other kids. But if I whack this kid in the back of the head, the coach will throw me out of practice and the coach will think I'm bad and the kids will think I'm bad, but nobody will think I'm dumb. No one will think I'm dumb. Okay. <laughs> Christina, that was my bad. I put this workshop together, especially for you guys, and I forgot I'd made slides for that. Next slide, please. As we get into increasing your knowledge, what are the most important things to understand if you've got a kid with a learning disorder? And under learning disorder, I'm listing 
all of what I call the hidden handicaps, the kids who have the mixed blessing of looking like everybody else, and yet they view the world very differently. Attention deficit disorder, autism spectrum, learning disabilities, dyslexia, those kids that have the mixed blessing of looking like everybody else, but viewing the world very differently. And I call it a mixed blessing. If I were king, I would want every kid with a learning problem to have a little star-shaped mole on his forehead so that any time an adult looked at the kid, they would realize, yeah, this kid looks like he's all together, but he's really gonna need some special help. And we need to understand the pervasive nature of the disability. And that's what many of my colleagues in education don't understand. They tend to think that learning disabilities are a school problem. And at the end of the day, when they leave class, they take their disability, hang it on a hook, go home, everything's fine. And then they come back and pick up their disability again. It is not a school problem. It's a life language and learning problem that impacts on them every moment of the day. And you know, I, when I change my slides, for years, I said it impacts on every waking moment of the day. It also impacts, on, but now we're finding for ADHD kids, it even impacts on when they're asleep. There's some great research being done at Johns Hopkins that indicates that, that learning kids with learning disability, with attention deficit disorder, I'm sorry, have a great deal of difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and when they sleep, it's not a restful sleep. So you put them to bed dutifully at nine o'clock, they wake up in the morning, every bit as tired as they were the night before. So the reality is it's a very pervasive disability. Now, we know the kid's got a memory problem. He can't remember the times tables. Well, he's got the same memory problem when he goes to soccer practice, and he's gonna forget that when the coach blows a whistle, he wants everyone to stop talking. He's gonna have the same memory problem when he goes to visit grandma on weekends, and he's gonna forget that you're not supposed to let the black cat out of the house of grandma's. Do we think he just has a memory problem in his spelling class, but his memory is fine other than that? Of course, it's a very pervasive problem. And I'll give you an example. Raise your hand, please, and I can't see you. You'll have to be honest with me. Raise your hand, please, if you know any learning disabled kids who have difficulty spelling. Yes, I can feel the wave of your hands going up. Most kids with learning disabilities can't spell. I had a kid in my class spell dog with a seven in it one time. What is that all about? But the reality is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that kids with learning disabilities can't spell is, slide, please. Next slide. There we go. It's what's called revisualization. Let me give you the re redesign just for any of this. If I asked Christina to spell the word America for me, she would picture the word America in her mind and then call off the letters. Either that or she called off the letters, the letters, letters would flash up on a screen. That's called revisualization. Many of our kids, that's why you pick up a flyer from the supermarket and you look at it and it says uh, uh, cantaloupes 55 cents. And you say, hey, that's not how you spell cantaloupe. And somebody says, well, how do you spell it? Well, I don't know, but I know that's wrong. That's because you can picture in your mind what cantaloupe looks like, and it doesn't look like that picture. So, um, so you, Christina uses a skill of revisualization whenever she spells. Many of our kids can't revisualize, therefore they can't spell, okay? The researcher backed me up on that. But do you realize that the kid who can't spell because he can't revisualize will also have a great deal of difficulty keeping his room clean at home for the same reason? Because Christina not only uses a skill of revisualization when she spells, she also uses it when she cleans her room at home. So here's the scenario. Christina has a big Super Bowl party at her house. Friends, relatives, all the family comes to see the Patriots play in the Super Bowl. Then the whole family comes in and they're watching the Super Bowl. It's a great game and everybody goes home. Christina walks in the kitchen. It's a pit, dirty dishes, pots, pans, everything all over the place. You know how she cleans the kitchen without even thinking about it? She uses a skill of revisualization. She pictures the kitchen clean and then does things to it till it matches that picture. That's how you wash a car on a Saturday morning. You look at the dirty car, you picture it clean and do things to it till it matches that picture. Do you think the kid who can't revisualize in a spelling class on a Tuesday suddenly develops a skill of revisualization when he goes home? No, he still can't revisualize. So on a Saturday morning, dad throws him in his bedroom and says, don't come out till the room is clean. He walked into the bedroom. He can't picture what it looks like clean. So he's got no idea where to begin. So he picks up a magazine. Whoa, Hulk and the Ultimate Warrior. I haven't seen this yet. And, then, and he's sitting down reading the magazine. Dad comes in 10 minutes later. It's World War III because he's not cleaning the room. He can't do it. He's unable to picture what it looks like. So he's like, no, I no idea how to begin the task. By the way, you know what you do with a kid like that? Get the room clean the way you want it. Take pictures from all angles. Put the pictures up in his bulletin board. That's what the room, room needs to look like on Saturday before you go out, Mike. It needs to look like that. 
Now he doesn't have to revisualize. Now he can, you know, look at the picture and say, well, in this picture, there, there were no books in the table. There were no books on the table. I better put those on the shelf. And in that picture, there were no clothes on the bed. And there were clothes on the bed there. I better hang those up. I'm not telling you to do anything for everybody, for the kid. I'm just saying you need to understand this is a very pervasive disability. Why are we surprised it impacts on his social skills? All of these academic problems that he has during the day also impact on his social skills. Now, what we've done, I think one of the reasons the book is, is the, uh, my book's gotten the attention it's getting is that we did something no one else has ever done, I don't think. Um, we followed the lead of the, re the field of reading. When I first started in the 70s in education, you'd get a file on a kid and say, the kid's got dyslexia or he can't read, okay? But there was no... You know, what do you mean? You can't read. The reading process is a huge thing. What are you talking about? So over the years, the field of reading has taken the skill of reading and broken it into the sub skills. So these are the sub skills that you have to have in order to be a reader. So now you get a file and say, this kid has a problem with uh, visual integration, auditory discrimination, and it gives you, you know, phon phonemic awareness, and it gives you all the specific sub skills that are, that the kid doesn't have that prevent him from learning to read. That's what we did with social skills. Uh, next, we're going to go uh, skip one slide and then another slide, Christine. There, one more. There we go. And these these are some of the skills. So instead of so now instead of saying the child has lousy social skills, you can say, well, he's got problem with timing and stage and social memory, zero order skills. We've actually identified those skills. And as we're going to quickly go through some of these, and you're going to, the moms and dads are going to think I've been looking in your kitchen window. And your teacher, the teacher's going to think I've been skulking around your classroom because these are the behaviors, the social behavior your kids have trouble with. And again, hopefully, instead of just saying this kid has poor social skills, we can now say this is the social skill he's having difficulty with. And let's, let's look at them quickly. Number one, timing and staging. Timing and staging is a social ability for a kid to understand that relationships are a process. Many kids with special needs view relationships as a product. In other words, it's not it's not a process that goes on. It's just a product. I want, hello there. You know, hello, I love you. Will you tell me your name kind of thing? You know, uh, uh, that they expect someone to be their friend automatically without the relationship developing. And I'll tell you what happens. Billy, a new kid, moves into the neighborhood. Johnny, the kid in the neighborhood with good social skills, waits till he sees Billy in his driveway. And then Johnny swings by in his bike. Hi, my name's Johnny. What's your name? Billy? Hi, Billy. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the neighborhood. Where are you going to go to school? Oh, Kennedy Middle School. That's where I go. We catch the bus right down the bottom of the hill. Um, uh, uh, you know, sometimes my brother and I, my brothers and I go to the, there's a mall not too far away and we take our bikes and go to the mall. Maybe we'll do that sometime. Okay. Nice meeting you, Billy. And Johnny drives away. Very very nice. Very nice first step in the process. Johnny is sophisticated enough socially to know that basically this is going to be the first step in the process of maybe becoming a friend. Then maybe you'll see him on the school bus. Later on in the week, you might ask him to come over to the house to play basketball. But that having a friend and making a friend is a process. Many of special needs kids don't get that. So here's what happens. Billy, the new kid, moves in the neighborhood. Bobby, the kid in the neighborhood with poor social skills goes running over to Billy's house and bangs in the door. Hi, my name's Bobby. Let's be best friends. You can sleep at my house tonight and I'll sleep at your house tomorrow night. You could, uh, you will sit next to each other on the bus every day, but you can't talk to Michael because he's mean to me. My parents go to Disney World um, every year and you can come with us this year. And when we, or when you grow up, your sister can marry my brother and my brother can marry you. And the new kid goes, well, back off much too fast. The kid does what we call putting out the candle. They try to make the friendship occur too fast. And if you're going to be my friend, you can't be anybody else's friend. Again, it's so much work to be your friend. Uh, that one of the problems we're finding, social problem we're finding they have, is they simply don't understand this idea of timing and staging. That it's a gradual process. That, that relationships aren't going to happen just because you want them to happen. It's a process. Social memory, as I said. He's got a lousy memory in, in spelling class on Tuesday. Why would you think he has a good memory at soccer practice on Saturday morning? Affective matching. Affective matching is the ability to match the affect of the other people in your environment. I'd be giving a lecture. There'd be 500 people in the lecture. Lecture starts at 9 o'clock. 
a couple people come in late. They come in at 9, 10. What do they do? They walk and sit in the back of the room. They don't come marching down the aisle and sit in the front row because their job is to do affective matching. Their job is to match the affect of the other people in the room. Now, everybody's sitting there quietly listening to a lecture. It's their job to come in and match that affect. Um, if, uh, if it was the beginning of the lecture hadn't started, it would have been very appropriate to walk and sit in the front row. But your job is to match the affect of the people in the room. Um, the story that I tell about that is when I was running the school, I applied for a grant, a big grant from a, a, from a, uh, a foundation. And everybody told me, don't apply for that. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get that grant. They don't give that kind of money to schools. And, but I applied for it anyway, and I worked real hard, and I applied for it. And it was before email and stuff, and I actually got a phone call. I'm sitting at my desk, and I got a phone call. We got the grant. I mean, a huge amount of money. It was going to make a big difference in the school. I was so excited. And first person I want to tell is my wife. Janet and I have worked together for 50 years now, our entire marriage. And uh, I first person I wanted to tell was Janet. So I go running downstairs to her office, and I said to her secretary, where's Janet? i got to talk to Janet. And she said, somebody said she's in the dining hall. So I go running over to the dining hall, so excited. I can't wait to tell her this news. I go bursting into the dining hall. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. All the kids and staff are in class. And I burst into the dining hall and there are three people sitting at a table at the dining hall, Janet and two teachers. And Janet's on one side and then there's another teacher on this side and the third teacher is sitting in between them. And they both, the teacher and Janet had their arm around the woman in the middle. They were all leaning in very closely, talking very quietly. And the girl in the middle, the young woman in the middle, is obviously crying. Okay. Now, I went bursting in to tell her this news. As soon as I saw what was going on there, affective matching. Whoa. Whoa. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it wasn't time to burst in with that news. So, whoop, put the brakes on. And I went over and I said, guys, what's up? What's going on? Janet said, oh, Kimmy just got a call from home. There's been a death in her family and she's pretty upset. I said, oh, Kim, I'm so sorry. Look, let's have someone take you home. We'll get your car home later on. Don't worry about things here. Think good thoughts. I'm really sorry. Hope things work out for you. And then I looked at Janet. I said, Kim, give me a call later. Will you? How many of your kids would have burst right in with the news? Totally unaware of their responsibility to match the affect of the people in that room. So as a result, many of our kids laugh at funerals and cry at high school dances and because they don't understand um, the, the affect of matching. Social prediction. Social prediction. Social prediction is self-explanatory. The ability to predict how people are going to respond to your behavior. Um, I've been on the road now for 45 years speaking, and I used to do a lot of political stuff. I don't anymore. I don't because I know whatever I say, I'm going to make 50% of the people in the audience get angry at me. And um, so I, that's what social prediction is. I can predict that people will be upset with if I do that, so I'm not going to do it. Right now, if I told a dirty joke on this on this uh, webinar, if I told a, a racist joke, I, I never would. Uh, but one, one of the many reasons I wouldn't is I know it would be a be, it would uh, impact negatively. It would. It would. Uh, people would be offended by it. That's what social prediction is: the ability to predict how your social behavior is going to be received. How many times do you find yourself saying to the kid, "Didn't you think? Uh, didn't you think about what would happen if you said that?" No, they didn't. That's the whole thing. They didn't think about it. They just said it without any thought of social prediction. Zero order skills. If you get to my website, a lot of work about zero order skills. Zero order skills are very difficult. Uh, to explain. Um, it's kind of like uh, my brother had to just spend several tens of thousands of dollars putting a new roof on his house. A lot of money they didn't necessarily want to spend, but the reality is he had to put a new roof on his house. But he said to me, none of my neighbors are going to say, oh, you know Tom Lavoie, he's the one who has a great roof on his house. In other words, you're expected to have a great roof in your house. You don't get any points for having a roof in your house. You'll lose points if you don't have a roof in your house, but you don't get any points for having it. And these zero order skills are skills that, that you don't get points. I mean, if I were to meet with Christina, and so Christina and Janet, my wife, have been dealing with this off and on. And suppose I were to meet Christina at a meeting. And as soon as I got back, Janet would say, hey, how was Christina? Because she kind of thinks she knows her from the phone. How was Christina? I wouldn't say, oh, she was had wonderful social skills. The whole time we were talking, not once did she take off her shoe and a sock and scratch, put her foot in the table and scratch her foot. She didn't do that once. In other words, Christina wouldn't get points for not doing that, but she would lose points if she did it. 
That, that's what zero order skills are. Zero order skills is just behaviors and skills that you're expected to have. Verbal pragmatics, the, the ability to realize that you talk one way in the locker room when you're talking to your male friends and another way when you're talking to grandma, that you change your language based on your audience is something our kids don't get. And one of the things socially our kids don't get is what's called awareness of image. They don't know how they're viewed by other people. Um, I dealt with this kid at, at our school and uh, he was a, you know, frankly, a fairly unattractive social partner. He's very loud, um, very crude in a whole lot of ways. But he was a sophomore in high school and his brother was a senior in high school. Now, his brother was the captain of the football team, the head of the dating club, dating the cutest girl on campus. The brother, the brother was the king of the senior class. Um, and so as a result, all the kids who were seniors were really nice to the younger brother, even though he wasn't a very attractive social partner, in order, they were nice to him in order to please his brother. Now, once his brother graduated and went off to college, the kid I knew, the sophomore, couldn't understand why nobody was nice to him anymore. I'm really popular. Everybody likes, well, no, <laughs> no. Awareness of image is people who hung out with you because of your brother. And now that your brother's not there, you really don't have a whole lot to offer. So what we're finding is that we're beginning to discover the very specific social skill problems that these kids have. So because they have the social skill, these social skill problems, next slide, please. Here's the important part. They violate what are called social contracts. It is now eight o'clock, Pennsylvania or Massachusetts time. It's eight o'clock. You have probably been through 5,000 social contracts today. Probably 5,000 social contracts. You go through thousands of social contracts every day. So many that you don't even realize it. And what is a social contract? A social contract is an unwritten and unspoken social expectation or duty that one has with others in this social environment, generally total strangers. And I'll tell you what I mean. Suppose on your way to work this morning, you decide you want a cup of coffee. So you stopped at Duncan's or your local coffee place. You get out of the car, you walked into the donut store, and there are five people waiting in line. You don't know them. You never met them before. You couldn't pick them out of a police lineup tonight. But for about 10 minutes, you had a social contract with those folks. They had social expectations of you, and you had social expectations of them. You had a social contract. What's your social contract of the people standing in line? Get at the end of the line. Could you imagine walking in and cutting into the line or going to the front of the line? I was I was, a weird, I was in an airport once. My wife and I were, were traveling and we're at the gate. We're getting ready to board the plane shortly. And I said to my wife, I think I'm going to use the restroom. I walked into the men's room. There are five guys waiting in line to use the restroom. This guy walks in, goes right to the front of the line and looks over his shoulder and says, I have to catch a plane. What are we? Security? I mean, of course, we're all here to catch a plane. What an incredible violation of the social contract. So you get at the end of the line, you've met your social contract with the people in front of you. Now three or four people come there standing behind you. Now you've got a social contract with them. you got a social contract with them now. What, what four or five things are the people behind you expecting you to do? Move up as the line moves up. You know, then pick you, you're standing in line and there's a space that guy, you know, move up, come on, move up, move up as the line moves up. What else? Decide what you want off the menu. Again, doesn't it make you crazy? You're you're late for work, you're waiting in line for five minutes. The guy in front of you gets up to the line to the head of the line and says, Let me see. Come on, man. You know, we're standing in line, decide what you want. And what's the third thing? Have your money ready. Have your money ready. Again, it Duncan's is crowded, everybody's in a hurry to get to work. The woman gets her order, that'll be $2.47, and she opens a pocketbook. What, you thought it was free donut day today? Lady, have your money ready. Just in that one little incident at the, at the coffee place, you went through four, five, or six social contracts. And somebody's leaving and they're carrying a bunch of stuff, you hold the door for them. You went through five, six, seven social contracts during that one little exchange. Kids go, people go through thousands and thousands and thousands of these social contracts. Um, and our kids don't understand it. They don't get, they don't understand what this, what the, these unwritten, unspoken rules are all about. The, uh, uh, and give you an example. I did a speaking tour through Hong Kong a couple of years ago. I was very excited about it. Never been to Hong Kong, certainly never spoke at Hong Kong before. 
And I got up to do the first presentation. We had about 400 people and it went well. I've been doing this a long time. I know when it went well and it really went well. But the end of the presentation, when it was done, very mild applause. Nobody made eye contact with me. Nobody walked up to see me. I thought, whoa, it's going to be a long couple of weeks here in Hong Kong. So I was going to the next venue and the woman who was sponsoring the thing, I was, she was driving me and I said, can I ask you a question? She said, Chill, what is it? And I said, how do you think that went? Oh, it went very well, got very positive comments. I said, well, the audience response wasn't exactly what I expected. She said, oh, I should have told you, and she should have, that um, when you speak or entertain in Hong Kong and the audience applauds, it's expected that the speaker will return the applause to thank them for their attention. I didn't know that. So not only did I not applaud, but I actually put my hands behind my back when they started applauding, which sent a very clear social signal to them that they had offended me in some way. Now, why do I tell that story? Well, it's 400 people in Hong Kong who is still trying to figure out what they did to offend me and that I ended up offending and neither of those things were true. I didn't understand my social contract. I didn't understand the hidden curriculum, which we're going to talk about. I didn't understand what my expectation was. Last night, I did a, uh, a Zoom like this with an organization in, in um, Canada. Social contract when, you work, when, uh, when you're working in Canada. Um, the, uh, uh, I ref I, I've said to you several times, because you're an American audience, that um, I worked at a residential school. The first time I spoke in Canada many years ago, I said I used to work at a residential school, and at the end of it, somebody said, wait a second, don't say that in Canada. If you look up on Google, that residential schools in Canada was really a scourge on their history, where in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the government came in and actually took uh, they they don't call their indigenous population Native Americans. They call them First uh, First Nation. They took the indigenous children away from their parents forcibly and made them go to schools to learn how to speak English and dress like uh, uh, and to assimilate. But it was done forced, and the kids were often they were often sexual abuse. It's a real stain on the on the glorious history of Canada. Um, and so to say you worked at a residential school in America means a boarding school in Canada. The hidden curriculum, the social contract, is you don't say uh, that you worked at a, at a residential school. So, um, so here's what happens. They've got these social difficulties. They've got the uh, timing and staging and all that. As a result, I violate the social contract. As a result of that, next, next slide. They, they've got these social skill difficulties, therefore they violate the social contract, and then they develop a negative reputation. If we're going to talk about reputation in childhood, you've got to forget everything you know about reputation in adulthood, because it is totally different one from the other. And I'll give you an example. You can, as adults, we can be flexible about a person's reputation. I bet you could name right now four or five people who you really like, who you really like, but you didn't like when you first met them. Adults can be flexible about a person's reputation. Kids, uh-uh. If Johnny doesn't like Billy in first grade, he doesn't like Billy for their entire career, for their entire life together. I remember walking down the street with our son Christian one time, he's about 17 years old. We're walking down the street in our neighborhood and this kid Michael comes walking by. Michael says, hi, Mr. Lloyd, how are you? And I said, hi, Mike, how are you doing? But Christian and he pointedly didn't talk to each other. So after Michael went by, he said, Christian, what was that all about? And he'd been gone to school with the kid for 12 years. He lives in the neighborhood. Why didn't you speak to him? I hate that kid. How come? Stole my lunch once. When? Second grade. I said, what's the statute of limitations on a bologna and cheese for crying a lot? It was nine years ago. Let it go. But in childhood, once a kid developed a negative reputation, that's it. It can't be changed. A couple of summers ago, I got a phone call from a woman in, uh, in um, uh, New York State. And she said, I got a real problem here. She said, my son had tremendous social skill difficulties. We've done an awful lot to make it better. He's much better now than he was before. Now he's in fifth grade. But the kids, every kid in the neighborhood and the community still labels him a loser. He doesn't have any friends, even though his social skills have got a lot better. And he wants to go off with Little League. And I know the kids are going to persecute him. What should I do? You know what I recommended? Send it to the Little League in the next town. The kids in the next town don't know that he... Uh, uh, wet his pants and learning different. I really don't believe that. I don't, they don't know that stuff about him. All they know is he seems to be a pretty well-adjusted fifth grade kid. 
she said it was the best summer of his life. He finally had friends because he didn't wasn't fighting that battle of reputation. She said it was a tough summer for her because now his best friends were living in the next town and she was slapping him back and forth all the time. But she said it was the best summer he ever had. That's how strong reputation is. Um, and adults can be situational about reputation. I can say I really like Jim Middleton. He's a great guy. He's a good, good friend. He was terrific with me when my brother passed away. He uh, I helped me build the deck in the back. I really like Jim Middleton. But I don't like going to dinner with him because he's fresh to the wait to the wait staff. He's often rude to the wait staff, and that embarrasses me. Uh, so I don't. So in other words, there's a lot of things I like about Jim. Some things I don't like about Jim. But there's enough things I like that I'll be his friend, and yes, someone will go to dinner with him. You know, we, we have that kind of relationship with many, many people. Uh-uh, not with kids. If Billy doesn't like Jimmy, he doesn't like anything about Jimmy. And if Jimmy saves Billy's life from drowning, it's not going to matter. It's it, it's a very pervasive thing. So here's what happens: the kids have the social skill difficulty. Because of the social skill difficulty, they um, violate the social social contract. Because of the social contract problem, then they um, uh, they develop a negative reputation. Now, next slide, please. Very quickly, then, if I haven't convinced you yet, why should we teach social skills? One, life in the waterbed. There is nothing nothing that gets a waterbed rocking and rolling like a kid with poor social skills. He's a source of great embarrassment to the siblings. He's a sort of great, great puzzlement to the aunts and uncles and grandparents and extended family. How can this kid be so socially obtuse when his brothers and sisters aren't? And it's a, it's a source of immeasurable pain for the parents. And many of you know what I'm talking about. And if you're a professional listening to this, let me tell you, the pain that a parent feels knowing that she looks up at the clock at 10.30 in the morning, she knows at that moment her beloved son is being bullied in the schoolyard at recess. There's almost nothing to describe the pain that a parent feels. It's one of the real reasons we really need to get on this. It's extraordinarily difficult for the parent to deal with knowing the child is being bullied and picked on. The second reason it's important is all environments are social. Think about it. Your kid can avoid any one of his academic problems. He can avoid it. He, if he can't read, he can uh, go play soccer with a bunch of kids. You don't have to read to play soccer. If he can't spell, he can play video. And we're not getting the money we need when we call it in to play video games. But if the kid's got a social skill problem, he can't avoid it. It takes social skills to play video games with other kids. It takes social skills to play soccer. So, so your kid can avoid any one of his academic problems, but all environments are social. Anytime there's more than one person in a room together, it's a social environment. I was speaking in uh, down in Connecticut the other day, and I was in the hotel. I was up in the hotel. The elevator got in the elevator. The elevator went up, opened the floor, and a woman walked in the elevator. Social environment. Anytime there's more than one person in a room together, it's a social environment. All environments are social. Thirdly, you can't compensate for a lack of social skills. I can compensate for any one of your kids' academic skills. You can't read, I'll put the book on tape. You can't write, I'll get them a computer. You can't spell, put a spell check on it. The reality is I can compensate for any, any academic difficulty your kid has, but if he has a social skill difficulty, I can't compensate for that. I can't sit in the school bus behind him, whispering to his ear, you know, now say this, now say that. And lastly, and you know, I used to explain this, I used to say this as, a, as a, uh, an opinion, I now state it as fact. There's so much research on this. The ultimate success and happiness of the kid you care about is far more dependent on his social skills than his academic skills. There is so much uh, research done on this now that proves the fact that the ultimate success and happiness of your child will be determined by the quality of his social skills, not the quality of his academic skills. And we've known this for 20 years, and yet skills, uh, schools still spending all their time trying to teach kids how to read, write, and spell, and God knows they should, but almost no time teaching kids social skills, even though we know their ultimate success and happiness will depend on uh, their, their social skills. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to quickly take a look at the relationship between learning disabilities and social skills. It's been a rocky marriage. In the 70s, we may believe social skill problems didn't exist. You know why? You couldn't test it. 
those of you young people out there, you think we're crazy about testing now? You should have seen us in the 70s. <laughs> we had all these new tests, the IPPA and the Woodcock Johnson. We love testing because, oh man, kids not doing well in school, send them to us, we'll test them. They never did anything with the data. I didn't know what to do with the data. We'd send it back to class, the teacher says, oh, he's still messing up. Well, send him up, we'll test him again. But, but, but you can't test social skills. There's no way you can quantify social skills. You can't say he's got a 2.3 reading level, a 4.1 math level, but his entering a group behavior is a 1.6, but his departing a group behavior is a 2.3. You can't quantify it, and because you couldn't quantify it, we ignored it. Then we got into the 80s, mainstream. It was a conventional wisdom. Take kids with poor social skills, put them in kids with good social skills, and they'll catch it, like you catch the flu. Well, I believe in inclusion for the most part, but the reality is it's not going to improve their social skills. Merely taking a kid and exposing them to good social skills will not improve their social skills. I hear many, teach, many parents say, I want them in regular ed, I want them to have good role models. Our kids don't learn social skills by role models. And you know what I use as evidence for that? You. Parents with special needs kids. Most parents with special needs kids I know have really good social skills, and yet their kids don't. Well, that's evidence enough for me that kids don't learn good social skills by merely watching good social skills. If they did, why didn't they learn them from you? Then we got into the 1990s medication. Put them on Ritalin, put them on silent medication. I'm not here to argue the merits of medication. I will tell you any of the negative stuff you hear is just wrong, misinformation, disinformation. It's a, those drugs are extraordinarily safe. They've been around for 40 or 45 years. No kid has grown an extra head. The medication is safe, and I've seen it change the lives of the kids. I've seen it save the lives of the kids, but it's not going to uh, improve your kid's social, social skills. It's a pill, not a skill. And now we're in the 2000s, 21st century, where we're doing formal social skills training. Well, you pack up your kid, send them off to a well-intentioned social worker on a Saturday morning with four other kids with poor social skills, and, and they work on social skills together. I'm here to tell you that can, that's not going to work either. I have very little faith in formal social skills training. You know, here's the analogy I use. Suppose your daughter wants to be a concert violinist. So you find the best uh, uh, violin teacher you can find in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And she works three hours a day, uh, three hours every Saturday with that, with that uh, uh, virtuoso uh, violin instructor. Fine, that's good. But that's not going to get her to Carnegie Hall. What's going to get her to Carnegie Hall? Practice, rehearsals, uh, recitals, uh, learning music theory. The, the three hours of training is good. But what's going to make it work, and she's going to be an expert violinist, is practice, 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 practice. And so the idea that sitting down with a social work on a Saturday morning in a social skills class is going to make a big deal of difference. I just frankly don't think, don't think that it is. So what does work? Here's what we recommend. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. What we recommend is what we call social skill autopsies. This is what a medical autopsy is. As you know, a medical autopsy is the examination and inspection of a dead body to determine the cause of death, evaluate the extent of damage, and gain knowledge will prevent it from occurring again. In other words, when a person has a, uh, uh, when a person dies under unusual circumstances or, or rare disease, they lay them out, open them up, take everything out and say, what went wrong here? What went wrong here? How much damage was done? And what can we learn to prevent it from happening again? What we recommend is social skill autopsies. Next slide, please. Social skill autopsy is the examination and inspection of a social error to determine the cause of the error, evaluate the extent of damage, and gain knowledge will prevent it from occurring to somebody else. Basically, when a kid makes a social skill error, instead of using it as an opportunity to punish, use it as an opportunity to teach. There's not a lot that the field of psychology agrees on. You know, Adler is on a view, doesn't agree with Freud, nobody agrees with Jung. You know, there's all this disagreement in the field of psychology. But the one thing that all psychologists agree on is this, that the number one need of human beings is to be liked by other human beings. The number one need of the human animal is to be liked and accepted by other human animals. Well, if we know that's true, and this kid is doing things that make parents always griping, the squeaky head turned off to him, make other people dislike him. Can't we make the assumption he's not doing it on a purpose? 
if one of his, if his main goal as a human is to be liked by other humans and he's doing things that make other people dislike him, can't we make the assumption he doesn't mean to do it? And if he doesn't mean to do it, if it's not purposeful, what are you punishing him for? You'd never punish a kid for wearing glasses or punish a kid for getting the flu. And yet we punish kids for making social, making social skill difficulties. Basically, the social skill autopsy takes a situation that's actually occurred and uses it, sits down with the kid, diagnose it, take a look at what happened, what could you have done, what opportunities, you have, what could you have done different? And the best way to teach you a social autopsy is to do one for you. This is one, the classic one, I've been, I came up with this concept over 40 years ago. But I'll give you one that I gave many, many years ago as, a, as an example to explain what a social skill autopsy is. I was walking to the dormitory at school and I had two kids, heard two kids, Tom and Chip having this big argument in their room, their roommates. And I went in, whoa, 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 guys, what's up? What's up? Chip said, I bought a new tube of toothpaste and Tom borrowed my toothpaste and lost it. Um, and now I don't have any toothpaste. I said, okay, Tom, come in. Let's autopsy this. We call them autopsies. <laughs> the, the kids don't view them as punishment. They don't view them as negatives. It's just another teaching strategy. Kids would actually come and ask me to do an autopsy. My last day at that school, one of the kids came in and said, Mr. LeWay, I know you're really busy today, but will you do an autopsy with me? My sister called from college last night. We got in a big fight. I don't know what I did wrong. Will you autopsy it with me? They actually ask for autopsies. And I said, okay, Tom, let's autopsy this. Step one, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. He said, well, I had to brush my teeth and I didn't have any toothpaste and I knew that Chip had a tube of toothpaste because I was with him when he bought it at CVS. So I took the toothpaste, he wasn't around to ask. So I took the toothpaste down to the bathroom and I'm brushing my teeth and Jim came over and he said, oh, can I borrow your toothpaste? And I gave him the toothpaste Then he gave it to somebody, he gave it to somebody and now it's gone, we don't know where it is, okay? Tell me what happened. Second question. What mistake did you make? What do you think you did wrong? And this is what's interesting, folks. Many times they don't know what they did wrong. And if they don't know what they did wrong, how does it prevent from happening again? I mean, the, the Hong Kong story I told you about applauding, un unless somebody told me what I had done wrong, I would have continued to make the same mistake and still wonder why people were being offended. Somebody had to tell me what my mistake was. And so I said to him, I said to Tom, okay, Tom, what do you think your mistake was? I know what it was, Mr. LaVoy. I won't do it again. I said, okay, what was your mistake? He said, I shouldn't have borrowed Chip's toothpaste. I said, no, that wasn't your mistake. If I had done what we normally do, which is to say, give him three bucks for a new tube of toothpaste, he would have thought his mistake was borrowing the toothpaste. I would submit to you that was not his social mistake. So to say, I said, no, Tom, I don't agree. I don't think that was your mistake. You and Chip are best friends. You've been roommates for three years. You were in a jam, you needed toothpaste, Chip wouldn't have minded you borrowing a toothpaste. That wasn't your mistake. And he said, oh, it's, oh, I know, I know what it was. I shouldn't have lent any to Jim. When Jim asked me for some, I should have said no. I said, you know what, I don't think that's it either. Chip and Jim are really good friends. Chip wouldn't have minded you giving an inch of toothpaste to Jim. That wasn't the problem either. And then finally the light went on, he said, I got it. I should have let go of the tube. I should have held onto the tube and squeezed the toothpaste onto the brush, but I never should have let go of the tube. I said, bingo, now you've got it. The social skill lesson for today is not do not borrow. It's not do not lend. The social skill lesson today is when you borrow something from someone, it's your job to return it. It's your job to return it. Step two, what's called a scenario. Now, by the way, the reason I love social autopsies, it's, it's so easy. I've been doing it for 40 years. Within five minutes, you'll be able to do them as well as I do. It's a very simple strategy. And the reason I love it is you can teach babysitters how to do it. You can teach older siblings how to do it. You can teach grandma and grandpa how to do it so that your kid will get seven or eight social autopsies a day. So I said, okay, what do you think? So he understood that what his mistake was, then the social scenario. And I said, okay, what we've learned here today is when you borrow something from someone, it's your job to return it. You can't give that responsibility away. You have a social contract since you borrowed it to return it. So let's try a little scenario. Suppose you're out in front of the school playing catch with the other guy, the other guys are playing catch, and you don't have a ball glove. But you know, I keep one in my office. So you stick your, your head in my office, say, Mr. Lloyd, can I borrow your ball glove? So I open up my draw, take the glove and toss it to you. You go out there, you're playing catch. 
the uh, dormitory counselor comes over and says, uh, gee, Tom, you didn't do a very good job cleaning your room this morning. You got to come up and straighten it out before, uh, before lunch. So you take the ball glove and you're on your way in to give it back to me. And one of the other kids says, hey, can I borrow the glove? What are you going to say, Tom? What are you going to say? He's going to say, no, I, I'm going to say, no, I, I can't lend it to you. It's not mine. I got to bring it back to Miss Lavoy. Bingo. Now you got it. And then if you're lucky, you can do, in many cases, you can do what's called social homework from the work of Tom Mitchell at the University of Ottawa. Um, social homework is a great idea, and it could be a supplement to the autopsy. And basically, here's what you say. Tom, what you learned today, when you, when you borrow something from someone, it's your job to return it. Here's what I want you to do. It's Monday. I'm going to check with you on Friday. And sometime in the next four or five days, I want you to look for an opportunity to use that new skill. Look for an opportunity to do that. And I'm going to check with you on Friday. Two days later, two days after the Monday, but two days before the Friday, I'm walking across campus and I hear this kid, Mr. Lavoy, Mr. Lavoy. I turned around, it was Tom. I said, hey, Tom, what's up? He said, I did my social skill homework. I said, you did? He said, yeah. He said, we had a big surprise snowstorm last night, and we're all outside playing in the stove and a great time. And we came back into the dormitory, and the teacher made us cocoa. And it was so good. It was so hot and so good. And she gave me this big snowman mug that her mother had given her for Christmas And I, um, about the need for. And one of the other kids, kids came and said, oh, that's a big mug. Let me use that. And I said, I can't. I can't lend it to you. I've got to bring it back to the dorm counselor because it's hers. Why don't you come with me and ask her if you can borrow it? But I can't lend it to you. Bingo, you've got it. You've got it. And so social skill autopsies actually, as it does, you take the problem, lay it down, open it up, take a look. And you never use the word should. You never say you should have done this, you should have done that. You say could. You could have, what could you have done? What could you have said? What options did you have? Um, that's the social skill autopsy. And it, it can be extraordinarily effective um, uh, for parents and for teachers. Basketball coaches can use them. It's a very, very simple technique. And the reason it works is it teaches in a natural environment. There's the one thing you know about our kids. They learn in a natural environment. Um, they don't learn in artificial kind of set up contrived environments. I remember when I was first starting as an administrator, there were some kids who were misbehaving, some of our kids misbehaving in the school bus, younger kids, and the school bus company called and said, you gotta take care of this. So I brought him into my office and gave him a stern lecture on bus uh, courtesy, uh, you know, how to behave and be courteous in a the bus. <laughs> they didn't get it. So I'm a pretty smart guy. I brought the kids in the next day and I set up a make-believe bus in my office with the chairs lined up like a bus. And they sat in the make-believe bus and we did a lesson on bus courtesy. <laughs> they didn't get it. Finally, okay, I called the bus company. I said, could you bring a bus a little bit early and leave it in the parking lot for 10 minutes uh, after school uh, tomorrow? They came, brought the bus. I brought the kids on the bus, did the lesson on the bus and they got it because that's how kids learn. And the, so our kids, and the social skill autopsy doesn't use a, from a book, Mrs. Green said to Mrs. Smith, it's actually people they know, people and experiences that they've had. So I have great, great faith in the social skill autopsy. Um, let me talk about some things that parents can do to make things, uh, to build their, so, to enhance kids' social skills. So next slide. I use the term social skills all the time because I've been using it forever, but I, I'm trying to stop. I'll have to be hypnotized because I keep using social skills. The real term we're using now is social competence. Social competence is a combination of social skills and social information. Social skills are the timing and staging and, uh, you know, uh, ability to predict, social prediction, social um, memory, that kind of thing. But social information is basically this. Social information is stuff. Stuff. I am a college educated adult, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, uh, the, uh, it's estimated that I have approximately one trillion pieces of information in my mind. One trillion pieces of information. They, they say we're a generation or two away from creating a computer that can really handle and manipulate as much information as we have the average person has in their brain. And we've got a storage and retrieval system where the, um, the your brain is filled with all this information. You go in, you pull out a card, you read it, you put it back in the same place. So right now there's nobody in this room, nobody, nobody listening to this who's thinking of um, Elton John. 
I would submit to you there was, I hope not, there was nobody thinking of Elton John. But I say Elton John, boom, storage can run into retrieval, pick up your whole, the card on Elton John. You can name some of his songs. You can picture them. You remember the sunglasses and the outfits and all that kind of thing. You've got a whole card of information in Elton John that was just sitting there. And as soon as I said Elton John, you could access that information. It's really an amazing, amazing system. Our kids, by definition, have difficulty with that system. So they don't have and maintain social information. Let me tell you what social information is. Um, suppose Christina, I've never been to, your, to wherever Christina lives in Pennsylvania, but Christina says, uh, you know, we're having some people over for drinks tonight. I live at 46 Maple Street in whatever town she lives at. Uh, we'll see you there tonight. I've never been to her town. I've never been to her house. I've never been on Maple Street. When I'm driving down Maple Street, I see 117 Maple Street on the left. Where am I going to look for 46? On the right. Because you and I know that all even numbers, one side of the street, all odd numbers on the other. Um, I check into a hotel, never been there before. The hotel clerk gives me my key. Mr. Lavoie, you're in room 805. Do I need to ask what floor it's on? No. What floor is it on? The eighth floor. Because you and I know that uh, the um, uh, first number in a hotel room indicates the floor that it's on. As I'm driving to Christina's house, I see a flag at half staff. What does that mean? Somebody's passed away. You and I, I, I come home from a trip. I walk into the, the middle of the night. I had a late flight. I come in, there's a couple of sandwiches on the on the counter in a, in a, in a, in a sandwich bag. And I open them up and one is peanut butter and jelly and the other is a, a tuna fish sa sandwich with mayonnaise. And I don't know how long they've been there. Which sandwich I'm gonna eat? The peanut butter sandwich, because I don't know, because I know, then you know that mayonnaise goes bad if it's exposed to the air. You and I both know odd numbers on one side of the street, even on the other. The first number of a hotel means the uh, floor that it's on. A flag at half staff means somebody's died. You and I all know that. But do you remember who taught it to you? I don't. It's just stuff you know. It's just information. You see, as normal learners, we're like sponges. We just soak up all this information. Not for kids with special needs. You need to teach them that stuff. In the book, I say, don't view waiting time as wasted time. If you're waiting in line with the, with the kids in the supermarket, use that as an opportunity to teach. Use it as an opportunity to teach. When you say, um, uh, uh, you know, you're sitting, in, you're standing in line at the supermarket and you say to your son, hey, see that man over there with the shirt that's got a, a green uh, design on it? it? It looks like a four leaf clover, but it's not. It's only got three leaves. It's called a shamrock. You know, shamrocks, so you, you think of the country of Ireland when you think of shamrocks and St. Patrick. Now, that man's probably from Ireland because he's got, you know, it's just bombarding him with stuff. See that sign over there? They've got a picture of a shopping cart and a big red circle and a line through it. That means no shopping carts over there. Anytime you see something and it has a red circle around it and a line through it, it means that's forbidden. Just bombarding them with social information. Now, some of it's going to stick and some of it isn't. But the only way that when parents say to me, what can I do to improve these kids' social skills? If you want to improve this, their social competence, try as much as you can to boost their social information, boost their social information. Next slide, please. Another thing I recommend for parents and teachers is focus corrections. Um, this is a strategy that we used to be big. Those of you have been around for a while. Um, remember, this was a strategy we used to use to teach writing to the kid to kids in the 80s. And the idea went away, and I don't know why, because it's a great idea. And here's what the concept was. Suppose you've got a kid who's got writing problems, spelling, punctuation, capitalization, the whole package is in trouble. He just says lousy written expressive language kids. So every time he gives you a paper, you pass it back and it's more red marks on it than blue, the punctuation, capitalization, all the mistakes made. Here's what you do is focus corrections. You say, Michael, I want you to write a hundred word composition for me about your dog. Um, and what, what I want you to focus on is the capitalization. I want you to really focus on making sure that all the proper nouns are capitalized and the first letter in each sentence is capitalized. I want you to really focus on the capitalization. Don't worry so much about the punctuation and the spelling. In fact, I won't even correct that when you pass it in. I really want to focus on the, on the capitalization for this lesson. You know what we found? On that paper, the capitalization improved and the punctuation improved. And the spelling improved and the handwriting improved because the kid was focused because he was focusing the incoming tide raises all boats all of the skills got better 
It was a great strategy and I recommend you use it if you get you right in the kids. Well, I came up with this idea when I was at an airport. Um, uh, I was having a meal, grabbing a quick bite before I got on a plane. And this woman walked in with her six-year-old kid. And uh, as soon as I sat down, the woman sat her on. You sit up straight. Don't you talk with your mouth full. Where is that napkin? Look at the way you're holding the fork. She was on that kid from the moment they sat down. It was just such an, un, such an uncomfortable experience for her, for the kid, for everybody who was in earshot. And she was just on him the entire meal. And I remember thinking, someday he's going to axe murder her. <laughs> and I would gladly testify for the defense. I mean, it was such an unpleasant experience. And I thought, what if she did focused attention, uh, focused corrections? What if she just focused on one skill for that particular meal? So, of course, at the school, we ate three meals a day with the kids. It was a residential school. And so I went back and I said to the staff, look, this is what we're going to do. Let's try this for a while. When we're having dinner and meals, breakfast, and lunch, or dinner with the kids, let's begin the meal by telling them what social skill we want to focus on for the meal. So the, the kids would sit down, and the teacher, whoever was, was the adult at the table, would say, um, uh, guys, I want to have a good meal. Let's have a nice meal tonight. You know what I want to focus on? Let's focus on our voices. Let's focus on keeping our voices you know, lower so we, people at our table can hear, but people at the next table can't. I'm not going to hassle you about the fork and the napkin. You know, that'll be, but right now, I'm really going to focus on keeping our voices down. You know what we found? They got their voices down, they handled the fork better, they handled the napkin, because again, they were focusing, they were able to, to, uh, to improve all the skills. So, you know, to say to the, to, you, to the kids that you're trying to teach social skills to your, you know, to your third grade class and say, what we're going to focus on this week is um, uh, being kind to each other, or we're going to focus on this week uh, um, the, the sharing the material, just some social skill and focus on that for the week, I think you'll find that things will improve. When I was a kid, um, you got up in the morning, got up when the sun came up, you went out and had frolic and played around all day, and then the sun went down, you came in, got a flashlight, and went back out again. That's what it was for generations. This generation of kids, not so much. Um, they, we, the, the coin of the realm now is, is play dates, having play dates with kids. Now, those of you who have typical kids, you know what a play date is. You call the mother, you say, drop the kid off at two, and pick him up at five. That's pretty simple. Not for the for special needs kid. And I've got a 16 page chapter in the book on how to plan a play date. And let's quickly give you the Reader's Digest version. Slide, please. Let's give you the Reader's Digest version of how trying to plan a successful play date for kids with special needs. The play date will be a disaster unless you consider some, some of these things. Next slide, please. Before the play date, okay, first of all, no triads. Never invite two guests because two guests means it's three kids. Whenever there's three kids, it invariably ends up two kids on one kid. And guess who that one kid's going to be? It's going to be your kid. Okay. Never invite two, always just one child so it doesn't be two against one. Get the siblings out of there. Say to the siblings, Michael has a play date today. I want you to go to the playground or I want you to go upstairs and stay upstairs or go visit a friend, but I don't want you around. And the reason why is invariably the sibling will become a more attractive social partner than your kid. And so the guest will end up hanging out with the sibling rather than hang out with your kid, which of course is the whole point of it. Get rid of the siblings, get duplicate toys, uh, you know, you have two dump trucks, two everything, two of everything, so that there's, um, uh, so that they're not going to be fighting over individual things. And if the kid has anything special that he's that he worries about, he's got a model plane or something. They're always worried about it breaking or something. Then put it away. And the reason I do that is I actually saw this in a play date. This special needs kid had a play date coming over and he had this model airplane that he really, really liked and he kept it on his desk and he didn't want anyone to touch it. It was very delicate, which is fine. But as soon as the, the guest came to the house, the special needs kid went up to him and said, look, you see that model over there? That's my favorite thing. Don't you, you touch that. I'm telling you, I'm going to just, you know, which is right away you started the play. Just take that delicate thing and put it away so it doesn't become an issue. And establish with your kid the house rules. You say you're having a guest come over, okay? The house rule is you can't go in the shed. 
The shed is where grandpa keeps his tools. You can't go in shed. That's the house rule. And by giving him the house rule, it makes it easier for the kid when the guest comes in and the guest says, hey, let's go in the shed. Instead of the kid saying, no, I won't let you, your kid, the host can say, no, the house rules say we can't. And most other kids will respect that. It's a house rule. Most other kids will respect that. So no triads, get rid of the siblings, duplicate toys, put the pressure stuff away and establish house rules. During, next slide please. Um, during the play date, next slide Christine, there we go. During the play date, keep in mind the child is the host and to emphasize that with him, the child is the host because you see, here's why play dates, I think blow up for most of our kids. They get bullied and picked on and annoyed and isolated and, and rejected all day long in the community and at school. Home is their castle. Home is where they're in charge. Their room is their castle. So when they have the guest over, they make the misassumption that my guest is coming, he's coming to my castle, we're gonna do what I wanna do, we're gonna play the games I wanna play, we're gonna do the things I wanna do. Well. It's the absolute opposite of what the relationship between it is between a host and a guest. It's the host is supposed to bow to the wishes of the guest, but because the rest of their life is going not that well, and he views home as his castle, his room as his castle, he's going to assume that every that my guest is going to do anything I want to do. You need to say no. You're the host. Have him greet the kid at the door. Have him take the kid and introduce him to everybody in the family. He's the host. It's really his job to do that. If you're gonna have a snack, have them help prepare the snack and really emphasize the point that you're bringing the guest in the house, you're the host, it's an important skill to learn and here's the things the host does. Begin with a structured activity. As soon as the kid gets there, have pipe cleaners or modeling clay or something that the kids can do that's kind of structured and you kind of hover over a little bit at the beginning, make sure everything goes okay, have a snack, you know, give them some deep, can't go wrong there and remember, the kids tend to remember and recall the first and last 15 minutes of any activity. That's the way kids happen to be. You know, they tell you about a movie, they tell you about the first 15 minutes, the last 15 minutes, and the rest is kind of a no man's land. Um, they're going to remember the first and last 15 minutes of the play date, your guest is. So make it go well. Make it have it be a, something that's fun at the beginning, and then at the end, when the mom's going to pick them up 50 minutes, put together something, have a snack, or sit around and talk. And, and so the last 15 minutes of it are, 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 are positive. And then after, next slide, please. After the, the play date, do kind of a modified postmortem. Sit down with them and say, well, how do you think that play date went, Michael? When was Billy happy? Didn't you notice how happy he was when you played checkers because he wanted to play checkers? And when did you have trouble? Remember when you got a little bit possessive about uh, about playing ball and you wouldn't let him use the general about you and if any of you a bit upset about that? In other words, let's sit down, let's take a look at what happened, not a scolding, not a negative, let's just take a look at what we could have done better. And here's one thing you wanna do. If the kid is gone on a play date, when you pick the kid up, take the mom or dad aside and say, listen, he has social skill difficulty and we're trying to improve that. Please be honest with us. How did he do? Now, the, normally the mother's like, oh, he was fine, he was fine. They say, no, there's not what I want to hear. I really want you to tell me how he did, what he did right, what he did wrong. Um, we're trying to get him to be better at this. And you could be really helpful to us, mom to mom, be really helpful to us if you give it, give us some, uh, some, real, some real feedback on how he actually was. That's the only way they're going to go well. Now, the last thing we'll have time to do, and I think we're going to get all this in. I love the alliance, but they asked for an awful lot to get into this little brief period of time, but I think we can do that. Um, the idea of hidden curriculum. Hidden curriculum um, is, uh, the concept of hidden curriculum is basically this. Uh, every home, every city, every school, every town, Every organization has its own hidden curriculum. What is a hidden curriculum? The unwritten, unspoken rules. Your family has a hidden curriculum. Maybe your family takes their shoes off before they come in the house every day. Uh, that's not written down any place, not a sign, but, every, but all your family knows it. Maybe your family uh, 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 at mealtime, uh, everybody brings their dishes to the sink. Well, that's just part of the hidden curriculum. and you know, That's part of the custom of your family. Um, and everyone is different. I remember 
when Jenna and I were first going together, my parents owned a variety store, one of the little mom and pop stores growing up. So, you know, it was, you know, it was a, you know, the store was open 14 hours a day and there was always one of us working at the store. So eating together in a meal was a very rare thing. So when we did have a meal together, which probably once a week, it would go on for three hours. That was the only time we got together. We'd sit and talk and talk and have coffee and the whole thing. Now, Janet's family was a much more traditional family than ours. And I was so surprised the first time I went there, the meal lasted 15 minutes. And I'm just in the middle of leisurely having my food and everybody else is done. But if that's the hidden curriculum in that family. Every organization has a hidden curriculum. I worked for a short period of time at the, uh, for Charles Schwab at the, at the Schwab Foundation in, in uh, San Francisco. And um, I was eight years old. Uh, I went there the first week. I, I remember saying to Janet, I've never met a friendly and groupy people. Everybody was so positive and so welcoming. Now, admittedly, I was a new director, but they were just really friendly, warm, wonderful, wonderful people. It was great. And that was the first week. And then I went on a business trip. I went on a trip for the foundation to El Paso, Texas, um, and came back on Sunday and went to work on Monday. All of a sudden, it was totally different. People were kind of cool. Nobody stopped by my office. People walk by the hallway without sticking their head in to say hi. People pass me in the hallway, not say anything. I said, whoa, what happened here? What went on? So I took my secretary aside that, that Monday night. When we're going home, I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah, what is that? I said, something going on I don't know about. You know, everybody was so friendly last week. And now following Monday, they, they just not. Anything going on? She said, well, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah, what's going on out there? There was a hidden curriculum, an unspoken rule at the Schwab Foundation, that if you went on a business trip, you always brought, brought food back from wherever you were, wherever you worked, um, and put it in the lounge for everybody to enjoy. Now, I noticed there was always food around, but I never knew where it came from. So what happened is I violated that hidden curriculum. I didn't bring back any food. So what was going on was, oh yeah, he guess he's the boss. He doesn't doesn't follow the rules. I saw him eating the food I bought, but I guess he's too good. And really, it took me a while to turn that around because I violated the hidden curriculum. And the problem, the good, the thing is, for those of us who are normal, typical learners, we know when you violated the curriculum. When I didn't clap, when I, I didn't uh, uh, return people's applause in Hong Kong, I knew there was a problem. I could sense there was. When this happened uh, in, at Schwab, I, I, I knew there was a problem. I, I, I sensed that there was. But our kids violate the hidden curriculum and they don't realize they've made a mistake. So they keep making the mistake all over and over and over again. Um, I remember when our kids were young, we were staying in Carhonks in New York and we went to church one Sunday morning and we walked in and our kids were good in church, but they were better if they could see the action and see the altar. And they looked in the front row, it was empty. So we all filed into the front row, five of us filed in the front row. We knelt down before the mass died and we're looking around, people are glaring at us, pointing to us. <laughs> Whoa, what did we do wrong? So I learned over, leaned over to Janet and I said, Janet, I think we made a mistake. She said, I. Yes, we did. We got a change. So we got up and moved to another row. Everybody looked at us and smiled and everything was fine. Just before the mass began, a bus pulled up and these five elderly nuns came and sat in the front row. There was a retirement home for nuns in the community and those nuns sat in the front row every Sunday for mass. We didn't know that. It was part of the hidden curriculum. Of the, there was no sign anywhere, but we were newcomers. We didn't know it, but at least we knew we'd made a mistake. We knew we'd done something wrong. So what happens is every school has its own hidden curriculum and our kids violate the hidden curriculum. And so let me give you a little bit of a reader's digest of what that is all about. What is the, what is the hidden curriculum? The next slide, please. What we're finding is that the reason many of our kids are failing in school is not because not making it in a regular school, is not because they can't handle the academics, but they can't handle the, the hidden curriculum. I can't teach you the hidden curriculum for your school because the hidden curriculum for your school is different from every other school. When I went to high school in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, Fitchburg High School, let me tell you part of the hidden curriculum. The teacher got up, the principal got up at the beginning of every year and said, students, there are three ways you can get into the school, the west entrance, the east entrance, and the south entrance. Those, all of those entrances open at, at, at seven o'clock. You can use any one of those entrances to get into the school. That was a standard curriculum. But every kid knew the hidden curriculum. 
the hidden curriculum was from seven o'clock till eight o'clock when the teachers come on duty, you use the south entrance or the east entrance, but you didn't go through the west entrance. That's where the tough kids hung out. And if you walked through there by yourself, they would have you for breakfast. And so the standard curriculum was use any door you want. The hidden curriculum was don't use the west side door until eight o'clock when the teachers are on duty. Okay, so basically what we've done is we've analyzed schools and I can't teach you the hidden curriculum because I don't know your school, but you as parents can, this is such an exciting project to work with the school to develop what the hidden curriculum is. Next slide. How do you, do, how do you find out the hidden curriculum? The resources, teachers, use your colleagues, use parents, use students, use student council. It's the students basically that write the hidden curriculum. We write the standard curriculum. The students write the hidden curriculum. Where I went to high school, um, it was part of the hidden curriculum that seniors didn't date sophomores. I don't know, there's no reason for it. It's just, if you were a senior, you never dated a sophomore, okay? Um, two years later, that changed. For some reason, it was okay to date sophomores. Um, what my wife went to high school same time I did in the next town. In her town, the education curriculum was nobody coupled off. It was all the, the boys and girls from the high school traveling together. Nobody really coupled off. In fact, if you did couple off, you were kind of rejected by the other kids. At my high school, next town, if you didn't, you weren't going out with somebody, you didn't go anywhere. Everybody went as couples. In two towns right next to each other, the hidden curriculum is different. The support staff, many times the support staff knows the hidden curriculum. Next slide, please. What techniques do you use to find the hidden curriculum? Interviews, brainstorming surveys, your publications. I can take a look at your high school yearbook and tell you what the hidden curriculum is in your school. Is in your school. But here's the fun part. Slide, please. What do you look at when you look for hidden curriculum? What things should you consider? Next slide, please. What should you consider? Be my friend, she can't talk to us for the kids. Number one, the physical plan. You will be amazed. You might find a kid who's a junior in high school who doesn't under, doesn't know that there's a restroom in each floor of the high school, who doesn't know that you can take a shortcut through the library to get to the media center, who doesn't know what areas are off limits, who doesn't know how to use their locker, who doesn't know that there are options at lunch. You don't have to get a hot lunch. You can get you can get a sandwich on. Who knows that where the infirmary or the library is? Many times we, what we find is our kids have no idea what the physical plant is all about. It's a puzzle to them. They just don't understand it. They don't understand the physical plant. Quick story. The kid I was working with, he was in a he was in a great big urban high school, four stories high. He was a jock, an athlete, but he was getting in trouble all the time because he was chronically late for class. He had special needs. He was chronically late for class. And the teachers were fed up with him. He doesn't care about school. He's lazy. He's a bad kid. You know, crucify him, crucify him. They were so upset with him. And not only was he late for class, but he'd run into class out of breath. He was a sophomore. He'd run into class out of breath. <laughs> panting so basically he would hang out with his friends in the very last minute and then run to class and he was late okay um uh it continued and continued and continued and somebody said maybe it's a hidden curriculum problem so they so they followed him you know what they realized he was doing because of his directionality problem the only way he knew how to get around to school was to begin in his home room so first period his home room was the beginning of the day his first period was on the fourth floor his second period is on the third floor, next period of the fourth floor, next period of the second floor. The bell would ring from homeroom. He'd run up four flights of stairs to go to his first period in the fourth floor. The bell would ring for his second period, which was on the third floor. He'd run back down to the homeroom and then up to the third floor. His next class is on the fourth floor. The bell would ring. He'd run back down to his homeroom and up four flights of stairs. He didn't understand. He could go right from the fourth floor to the third floor. When we finally explained it to him, he said, I thought I was the only kid in the school who didn't have a library pass. He had no, he said, I couldn't understand what was going on. He said, I'm a, I'm a big jock, I'm fast. And I'd run up the stairs and down the stairs and I'd go in and the kids would be already sitting in class. I, and he was being yelled at and ang the teacher's angry because he wasn't uh, following the rules. He's being late for class. He didn't understand the physical plan. Did they know how to use their locker? Do they, know how, do, they, do they understand the physical plant of the school? Many times you'll find that they don't. Next slide, please. Do they understand the social environment? 
Do they understand the cliques? Do they understand the rivalries in the school? Do they understand what dating means, what it means to go out with somebody? You know, the, go, the phrase going out in one high school might mean something totally different from the other school. Clothing, do they under, you know, I think it should go this far if you're a teacher. You got a special needs kid in your class and he's on the outside looking and he's isolated and rejected by the other kids. And you hear him saying, my mother's taking me out shopping tonight and buying a new winter coat. I think it should go this far. Bring him over and say, hey, come here for a second, Michael. Notice whatever, all the coats that the kids are wearing. Mike, Frankie's got one on, Joey's got one on, Billy's got one on. They're wearing this year those um, denim short jackets with a, a sheepskin collar. You notice everybody's got, when you go to get a coat tonight, this might be what you want to look for. In fact, let me write that down. A denim coat, the short denim jacket with a, with a sheepskin collar. Uh, maybe this is what you want to look for tonight. If you don't do that, He's going to show up with a, look, with a long coat to the floor with great big toggle buttons, and it'll be one more thing for the kids to make fun of. Do they understand what's in and out? Do they understand the slang? Do they understand what's going on in the school? Do they understand the social environment? Slide, please. Do they understand the administration? Do they understand who works for who? Do they understand the chain of command? For years, I was the number two guy at a school, and the guy I worked for was kind of a jerk, frankly. And they, you know, somebody would come up to one of the kids to come up. I think you should fire Mr. Taylor. Well, I think that's a pretty good idea, but I worked for him. Did they? Did, did they understand who works for who? Did they understand the job description? So, they, I mean, I would be walking across the campus of the school. Now, we had uh, 150 kids, 130 staff. I had to raise seven million dollars a year to keep the school going. I would submit to you I was a pretty busy guy. And I'd be walking across the campus and one of the kids would come up, Mr. Lavoie, there's no more red chalk in the art room. <laughs> Say somebody else, you might want to talk to about that before you talk to the president of the school. But they no understanding, no appreciation for the roles that, that administrators play. Do they know what who to go to? Do they know the, who to go to if you're in this kind of trouble? Do they understand the administration? Slide, please. Do they understand the faculty? Do they understand the faculty? Do they understand that Mr. Smith gets bad, gets bad if you lean back in your chair, but it doesn't bother Mr. Jones? That Mrs. Jones gets upset if you don't get your homework done, but Mr. Mr. Butler never, never collects that homework. Do they understand um, uh, the, you know, the, the reputations of the teachers? Again, I think it should go this far. Suppose I'm a teacher and I've got, uh, I've got uh, uh, Two, two kids, Paula and Nancy, are students in my in my class, and I'm going to mainstream them. I'm going to put them in the, into the mainstream. Okay, I've got these two kids, and I'm going to go to the classes. So let's make the teachers be named uh, Nancy and Paula. That's what I'll do. So I've got a, a couple of kids I want to go. They're going to be mainstream. I go to the teachers, and I go to Paula, and I say, uh, Paula, I'm going to be putting a couple of kids in your class, uh, mainstream a couple of kids in your class. I, I got a couple of questions for you. Um, what do you think about homework? What do, you, what, what do you think about being late for class? What do you think about tardiness for the class? No, she said, I'm not a big deal. That, I'm not, you know, it's a big school and the only chance that kids have to see each other is passing in the hallways, you know. The, you know, I, I don't believe in late passes, you know, bottom line, if the kid's late for class, send him for a late class, he's just more late. So what I do is I put work in the desk and when they come in, I expect them to sit down and I get to work, but I don't really begin the class until two or three minutes after the bell rang. Okay, fine, good. What about homework, Paula? What do you think about homework? Oh, homework, yes, very important. I think very important kids learn to do quiet study. I think that's a very, very important thing. So I'm a big nut at home. I collect it, correct it every day. Okay, good. What about final exams, Paula? No. I give a final exam because they make us, but I'm not really a big believer in final exams. I know what the kids can do. I look at their homework stuff. I know what they can do. I don't need a final exam to tell me that. Okay, Paula, thank you. Then I go to Nancy. Nancy, um, I want to put a couple of kids in your class. What do you think about Tardiness. Oh, I'm a nut about that. I real. I mean, I think punctuality is a very important skill for kids to learn. If I'm going to be on time, they're going to be on time. You don't. They call me the queen of the late pass. If you don't get, if you're late, boom, go get a late pass. I'm a real. It's a real thing for me. Okay, fine. It's fine. What about homework? Um, no, no. I don't. You know, we got a lot of kids from families that are, you know, both mom and dad working. A lot of single parent families. I, you know, I, I don't. I don't think it's fair to burden. I don't do a lot of homework with kids. I just, I just don't. I don't give a lot of homework. When I do a lot of times, I don't even collect it. Okay, what about final exams? Oh, yeah. I give a tough final exam because I you know, I got to give the kids a grade. I don't have anything to base it on. So final exam is very important. I say, okay, fine. Then I sit down with my kids. I say, listen to me. 
If you go in a class and you're running late, you go in a, if you go in a Paula's class, get your, go get your books, don't worry. It's not gonna be a problem if you're late. If you go into Nancy's class and you've got your books, forget the books, get the class. Get the class on time. She wants you to be on time. Now, when it comes time to home, for homework, um, you got, you're retired, you got two homework signs to do, Paula's and Nancy's, do Nancy's. Don't worry so much about Paula's, do Nancy's. That's that, uh, because she's gonna collect, uh, I'm sorry, do Paula's, because she's gonna collect at Nancy's money. And for final exam time, we're gonna really focus on Nancy's exam, because that's it. We'll study for Paula's exam too, but we're gonna really focus on Nancy's exam. And you know, I'll do this and teachers will say, well, that's unfair. You're giving the kid an unfair advantage. All you're doing is saying to the kid, what every other kid in the class knew after the second day of school. See, our kids don't pick up on, on these subtleties. They don't pick up on, you know, it would take watching Nancy crucify 10 kids before our kid begins to think, hmm, there seems to be some kind of a pattern here, you know. Um, they, under, they need to understand that, that there's a, uh, um, uh, the, 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 each, kid, each teacher has their own personality. Next slide, please. Do they understand the extracurricular activities? You know, do they understand they can sign up for extracurricular? Do they understand, you know, the thing about extracurricular, you take a great big high school with 2,000 kids and you bring it down to 10 kids who like to collect stamps or collect coins or do puppetry. You take that great big school, you make it smaller. So encourage, encourage them to do extracurricular. And the last slide, I think, do they, slide please, do they understand the schedule? Do they, one back please, if you could, do they understand the schedule? Do they understand? I am. I have extraordinary attention deficit disorder. Before, for two hours before I sat down to do this, I just walked. I just walked, and we're going to get done, and I'm going to walk again for another two hours. Sitting down for me is extraordinarily difficult. I had tremendous attention deficit disorder for four years in high school. I never knew what my schedule was. Never knew what my schedule was. But I knew this. I know first period I had with Danny Petridis. I also had second period with him. So I'd follow Denny Petridis the second period. Never knew where I was gonna end up. I just knew I'd follow Denny. And then in second grade, um, uh, Laurie Lynch and Tim Mulligan were in my uh, in second period class and also my third. So I'd follow Tim or Laurie to go to my next period class. Never knew what my schedule was, never any idea. It's just part of the, way the, the brain that takes care of schedules you know, it isn't, uh, uh, doesn't work for me real well. So basically, does your kid understand the schedule? Does he understand when you have modified block schedule days? I worked with a kid who every time they used to have a special schedule every Wednesday where they took the schedule and turned it all around. He used to confuse him so much. He spent every Wednesday, he'd run out of school at nine o'clock and sit in the woods and cry all day. And he got in all this trouble for being um, a truant and stuff until somebody figured out it was a hidden curriculum issue. He didn't understand how to use the schedule. So basically the hidden curriculum, every home, every family, every, every town. They, I, I live in a town of Barnstable, Massachusetts. I learned the first week I was there, if you want to make it in Barnstable, Massachusetts at the post office, then give to, to, to Toys for Tots. So you have a big thing every Christmas, Toys for Tots. And my first Christmas, I gave a bunch of toys for Toys for Tots. And the postmaster's like, he's my best friend. He'll call me. He'll call me during the day and say, you've got a special delivery package. You might want to come down and get it. Because why? Because I met the hidden curriculum. I donated to Toys for Tots. Every company, every family, everybody has their own hidden curriculum. What we're finding is the reason the kids are failing in regular ed, special needs kids, is not because they can't do the standard curriculum of reading, writing, and math, but they don't understand the hidden curriculum of the social environment at school. We are right up against time and I don't want to go over, but um, kind of in summary here, what we've talked about, and please, I am religious about returning. I said I spoke to a group from Canada yesterday. I spent all day today answering emails. Don't hesitate to send me an email and ask me for information. The bottom line is this. We're beginning to recognize that one of the reasons our kids are failing the way to a greater degree than we'd like. We spend so much time getting kids ready, especially needs kids ready to go off to college. And we found last year that 65% of the kids that went off with special needs who went off to college in September came home by Christmas. They couldn't, not because they couldn't handle the academic work, but they couldn't handle the social, they couldn't handle the social side of college and the social side of their environment. The reality is we know there's things we can do about social skills. It's 95% of a kid's day is spent in social environments. There are things we can do to make it better for these kids. Understand the hidden curriculum, 
using techniques like uh, um, like the uh, autopsies and successful play dates, those kinds of things. There are strategies you can use. I'm not here to sell books. That's not what I do. But the book, most of this thing comes from a thing I wrote called Helping the Child with Learning Disabilities Find Social Success. It's so much work to be your friend. Um, it, it's got this information in it. And then a lot of other information that's helpful for teaching kids about their learning disability and teaching um, the brothers and sisters how to deal more effectively with the kids. So again, God bless the work of the Alliance. I think the idea of parents getting together to make change, the reality is, and I don't want to create a bunch of activists among you, but the bottom line is this, if I poke you with one finger, you're not going to feel it. But I put five of them together, you're going to know you've been hit. And if we're going to make changes that we want to make for our kids, we've got to work together. As parents and teachers who care about these kids, we've got to work together in unison in order to get the job done. Being the lone wolf parent who's fighting with the school system all the time, all you're doing is poking. You're not getting anything done. You get a group of parents who feel the same way and want that kind of help for the kids. You form an alliance, and then you're going to get the job done. And God knows the kids deserve it. Thank you very much. I had a wonderful time with you. Hope we see you on your road sometime. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Mr. Lavoy. Thanks so much to our audience for uh, joining us. I'd recommend if you're interested, check out our upcoming events. And once again, thank you so much, Mr. Lavoy. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a great night, everybody. Bye now.